chore. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, and thank you. Uh, we'll take you on a virtual tour, and we'll highlight some of Dan's work in the show. And um, behind me, you can see the incredible entrance to Fired Up Glass today. And this is an installation by Megan Stelgess that's actually going to stay at the museum. And so I love when you get off the elevator, the sound that you hear from everyone, it's a, whoa. <laughs> and then the question is always, how in the world are you gonna keep those bananas fresh the entire exhibition? And then that's when you get to talk to them about glass and different glass techniques beyond um, just the furnace. And so after, viewing this beautiful installation that was uh, conceived during COVID as a way to bring happiness and light in a very dark time. Uh, you get a sense of a little bit of the past and how that translates into the present uh, and where we have been and where we're going in contemporary glass and glass today. So we have this gorgeous, example of uh, some of Lino's most recent work and Nancy Callan, Dante. Um, uh, we step back in time and time uh, through the Wadsworth's eyes when in 1976, through our matrix program, we not only exhibited, but we purchased these interesting prototypes that were done by Chihuly and Jim Carpenter. And right up in the front of the show, we discussed that that history and that 60, that 60 year um, mark and the anniversary of the Studio Gloss movement, but how uh, we are trudging forward with more narrative and looking at social concerns. Um, also, right up front, we, we talk about flame working through Micah Evans's beautiful Singer sewing machine. This is actually his first of three. And if you're getting whiplash, just shout out and say, hey, uh, quit turning the camera so much. Um, and I thought it was important uh, to place Jason McDonald in this, this, this part of the show, the, this past and present. And you know, he's a master of technique, but in that discussion about narrative and the importance of these shared realities around race and uh, environmental concerns, sexuality, other really uh, forward um, conversations that are so very relevant to, to many of us today. Um, this is, it brings that conversation to the discussion of, uh, you know, the importance and of technical prowess, but also pushing boundaries, not only through um, the creation of a work, but the conception. And I the designer is Lee Weaver, as we mentioned, and Lee does not call this the runway, but I do. <laughs> um, and one of my, my favorite baskets of, of Dan's, I actually saw this in Seattle and I've seen a lot of his work and a lot of his baskets. And this particular one stood out to me, um, not only because of the, the work itself and its artistry, but this specific work, Aunt Fran's Basket. And Dan tells the story so eloquently uh, about Aunt Fran and how she, um, she helped him connect and to move forward in his work in a way that was a moment. You know, she had, she encouraged him to find his own path, his own artistic path. And she also said, looking to your past and that tradition of, you know, illumination, Salish people, that thousands of years tradition, uh, you can bring that into the present and, and you can tell these stories through your own work. And I, I just thought that was, it was beautiful. 
Um, and so it's, you know, it, it, it speaks to technique, but in this show and in Fired Up, uh, we, we acknowledge that glass today is a, a great deal about, about storytelling. Um, and you see uh, Peter Brimmers and some flame working uh, with, with Carmen's Sugar Sugar. I love her new work. It's so fantastic. Um, and Sugar Sugar is one of my favorite. We do address um, the, you know, flame working is shown throughout as one of the many techniques that are um, used by artists today working in glass. Um, and here is a, a little section that is devoted to the pipes. We, we talked about that with Tim Tate. And I love seeing Demetra and Dean, the sight line to this, um, to this installation, flying under the sky, is seen all the way from across the room. Uh, it's, it's stunning. And I have to tell you a little story. I heard over the radio, because I was in the hot shop, that uh, there was a spider in the leaves and that the guests were trying to, <laughs> to, to help. And I said, tell them I'll be there just one second. <laughs> and I ran up three flights of stairs and sure enough, there was this little spider who was so comfortably <laughs> crawling in this installation. <laughs> um, and I had to flick him off into oblivion. Um, but this, uh, you know, flying under the sky is, is stunning and um, Pat Tavera technique is certainly captured um, our guests' imagination. And so just to back out and show you some of that, that sight line. Um, and Shana Leibs, uh, Shana Leibs, uh, uh, American and French pastry series is phenomenal in its use of ceramics and glass and all of the techniques. I often marvel that this was once packed and those cherry stems survived. That's <laughs> incredible. Um, and, you know, this is a commentary on desire. Uh, what do we desire most that, that which we can or cannot have? Uh, and also on uh, Ameri America and its, its use of chemicals and preservatives in our foods. Um, so to take you back, um, and we'll just continue on. Uh, we talked a lot to our guest about Martin and his unique hot sculpting technique. And also that you can have sculptural, sculptural forms like Ben Cobb's red squiggle muscle but he is still telling a narrative between nature and, and human biologies. And um, he's drawing on inspiration from so many things in nature, uh, biology, and bringing those together in gorgeous sculptural forms that really have a message. Uh, <laughs> Megan Steljess, as I mentioned, you know, she, she often talks about uh, sex, sexuality, uh, consent, um, sexual health. And I have to tell you, when I was giving one of my docent tours, someone asked me, how does a banana relate to that? And I said, oh, dear me, I can't go back to <laughs> the conversation about the birds and the bees. Um, and here you see Ken Thomas cloud capturing apparatus and cloud writing contraption. Uh, you know, this is when you feel marginalized and out of place, you often wanna escape into some other world or realm. And these clouds, if you capture them, you too can ride away and be somewhere else. A lot of the artists, if we're gonna uh, talk about Dan for one other second, uh, he did this installation of Salmon Run specifically for the Wadsworth. Uh, and this, uh, these salmon sculptures were actually made uh, in 2022. But with this, you know, we, we talk about ecology and that history 
of um, indigenous peoples being here for millennia. And then what happens when natural resources are taken away and they're relegated to places, uh, you know, the illumination is now residing on a small spot in what is the San Juan Islands and all of the islands and all of the land. Um, used to be theirs and the respect they gave to the natural resources and then what happens when those resources are taken away and depleted. So, you know, and also the configuration, which Dan will, will talk to you about at some point, um, is significant in terms of um, the head uh, salmon and how they move through the water. Yeah, actually, uh, Brandy, if I can jump in for a minute. Yes. A, a really timely moment here that Dan oh, yay. solved his issues and is able to start his presentation. So I'm so glad we got to see his installation there and um, a little bit of his work in the museum. And now we can turn things over to Dan. I will have Howard put the spotlight on him and um, have Dan get started with his presentation. So thank you everyone for rolling with us today and I'd uh, love to introduce Dan Friday. You are muted, Dan, so uh, you are gonna have to unmute yourself. And thank you again to Brandy Culp. Thank you very much for doing that. Hi, Scott. Yeah, I'm so sorry. My apologies, everyone. I'm computer challenged here. Uh, uh, yeah, hi, Scott. I appreciate that. Thanks, for everyone, for hanging in there. I guess you guys are the true blues, huh? Sorry. <laughs> um, the uh, Let me just figure out the share of the screen here, too. Um, let's see here. Share screen. Boom. Uh, PowerPoint. Is that working right there? You, yes. All right. Let's do one of those. You got it, Dan. Good job. All right. Hey, thanks, team. Thanks for hanging in there. Uh, really sorry about that again. Uh, uh, it's, and it's not, uh, quote, quote, or Dan Friday, um, a member of the Lummi Nation, and uh, happy to be here today. Also a glass artist from Seattle. This is, uh, this is where I come from. This is Lummi Island, which is a resort island and not necessarily uh, the Lummi Reservation. If you see just to the right of that, that's that little peninsula. That's actually the Lummi Reservation. But all the San Juan Islands here, this is where the Lummi people come from. Uh, prime real estate, great uh, sailboat country right there. Uh, but uh, kind of a small little wetlands that we're on now compared to the to the great islands that we're, we're from. Uh, this is my sister, Ray, Ray Friday. I'll just kind of add her in my story a little bit because our story and our past was glass artists kind of uh, go together. Um, this is my family, my brothers, my Auntie Pauline Scala, the killer whale at the Stomish boat races. This is my great, great grandfather, Quokot, or uh, Heitalak, pardon me, and his family. And I uh, just kind of want to point out the, the fly couture of the day, Coast Salish blankets. Uh, and this is, he, he's a really strong uh, person in the Coast Salish uh, community. He lived in both, like his, he kind of stood in, in two different timelines. He was really from uh, the longhouse tradition and lived in a longhouse. He had 22 children. And when his oldest son, Richard, died, uh, he raised his 12 children too in his longhouse. And uh, my great grandfather, Quo Quo, uh, was his uh, first born son, Joseph Hilaire. And Joseph Hilaire, you'll see here, this is my uh, great, great grandmother, Agnes Haumea, who's actually half Hawaiian and half Cowichan. There's a long history of Hawaiians in the Puget Sound, but that's a, another presentation. This is a Nootkin style canoe, which is from the northern, uh, from northern Vancouver Island, but this was kind of like the Toyota Prius of the time where everyone had one of those. This is the Setting Sun Dance Troupe. And this is kind of the first photo of my great grandfather, Koko who I share the name with in the front and center. And that's uh, Hetaluk's son. This is another picture of my great grandfather, Joseph Hilaire. Uh, my son's name is Joseph. My middle name is Joseph. We have one of those families where everyone uh, has the same name. Uh, 
So there's probably about 20 Joe Hilaris up there. Um, this is my uh, grandmother, uh, Edna Price from Nisqually. And uh, this is Cousin Harry, because I got jokes, because I'm late. <laughs> got to keep it, keep it moving. Uh, but today, this is, uh, this is Stomish today. This is the canoe races that are annual, that have been going on for hundreds of years at Lummi and Hales Pass. And uh, I just feel re really grateful to be from a place where Native culture still exists and has survived through, uh, through it all. And uh, a lot of times when I'm traveling through the... United States or other places, a lot of, you know, streets will have namesakes of, of tribes or tribal names, but there's not much of the tribes to be found. Uh, so much like in the Southwest and the Northwest, I'm really grateful to still see these vibrant communities uh, practicing their traditions. This is a glass panel my sister Ray did, Ray Friday, uh, of Hales Pass in those canoe races. There's a picture of her making work at the Pilchuck Glass School. This is some of her work. This is her thesis. This is over a ton of glass. And she's an amazing glass artist, but she's not, she's a bit of a wallflower in some regards. And that's why I always try and toot her horn a little bit when I'm up here talking about my work. Um, this is uh, my former life. I was a fisherman mostly <laughs> and a mechanic and something I gave, quit so many jobs just to go fishing, work on cars, hot rods. Um, and when I was 20, I found glass blowing. And so I uh, have started at a factory and kind of made these connections. This is a uh, Preston Singletary, uh, much through the Pilchuck Glass School. And just by proxy of being in Seattle and you meeting so many uh, amazing artists, uh, you know, I was ready to make factory items and paperweights for the rest of my life. But after going to Pilchuck and meeting, you know, Dale and the likes of people in about 2000, just has uh, really influenced my career and in a way that is different from, you know, like accredited art rubber stamped. Uh, I, I don't know, like you're just not like anointed to be an artist. It has that old world uh, feel of, of apprenticeship uh, when you come up that way. These are some of my very first pieces. This is the Ruben, this is my first fishing boat. It's my uncle Ruben. There's some of the early pieces, early 2000, 1999 from my first show at the Daybreak Star Cultural Center with Terrence Guardipi, canoe paddle, Tommy's Hawk. These are called Serenades. This uh, piece is called This Land Is. Uh, this is Trail of Tears. And these are from about, like I said, 2000. I mean, it must be 2001. Uh, and after about 12 years of working in glass, I uh, went to my Aunt Fran and kind of said, Hey, you know, look, I'm, I'm working for this great artist named Dale Chihuly, but she had, um, but she said, well, where's your work and who's that? And uh, it was, it was a real like epiphany for me. It was like, you know, hey, auntie, I work with these, everybody I work with has got these uh, art degrees and it's really tricky to get a job. And my aunt, who I'll go into more later, is just a really powerful uh, figurehead for our community and culture bearer. And so when she said, well, I'm not an artist and her stuff is in the Smithsonian and around the world. Um, you know, she's just been a huge cultural purveyor for uh, our tribe. And her son was a hereditary chief. And so uh, when she kind of said, I want to see your work, it's time to get to it. I, I, uh, I took that to heart. Um, this is an owl that stayed in my cabin at Pilchuck after I'd been making owls for about a week. Sorry, there should be more images of that. This is uh, the, the crest, the hate to luck. Hey, Tulux Crest, the Crest of the Bear. And you can see I wear one around my neck. It's like a family crest. These are some of the first bears I made. The first ones had legs, but I don't think that they needed them because it's they're so glassy. It's a raven totem. Lots of ravens. This is the Wecklium totem, or Wecklium comb. The Wecklium is the name of the Lummi Longhouse. This is uh, my great-grandfather, Quoquo, and he is a carving a story pole or totem pole, as they're more commonly known. Uh, in front of the Norton building, which is a really historic building in downtown Seattle. And uh, although he passed, he, he passed before I was born in uh, 1968, he, his, his legacy has really shaped my path a lot. And I've been really honored to carry his name. This is a book about him. This is his last living totem pole. 
And this totem pole has been restored uh, twice now. It's in front of the Whatcom County Courthouse. This is uh, of the Senese, the sea serpent. And it is uh, probably 90% fiberglass, uh, you know, and, you know, there's wood in there, but it's been so repaired so many times, it's hardly the totem that it was. And uh, that's what brings me so much joy in working with glass is telling these Coast Sailor stories. This is the bust of Akhenaten uh, from the Corning uh, Museum of Glass. And when I study there and to see this thing that, you know, is a little rough around the edges, but it almost could have been made yesterday. And that permanence of glass, that uh, ability to survive millennia, uh, to, 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 to just kind of that permanence, although it's very fragile, even if it breaks, there's some iteration of it. Whereas a lot of the works of my uh, great grandfather, I sure wish I had one of his poles or more of his work to see it returns to the earth. This is one of my totem poles. This is the forager totem. This is Aunt Fran, who I told you about earlier, Chi Top E. Uh, she's, uh, again, her son, uh, Bill James, our Chief Salit, uh, who passed away last year, um, were really influential to me as well. You can see she's a basket weaver. Those are some of her mountain goat wools she's sitting, blankets she's sitting on. And uh, I, her encouragement, you know, like I just remember, you know, just going to her, her place and it's where, you know, she wasn't an accredited artist or she didn't need anybody's approval either. You know, it's like, be careful who you're looking for a pat on the head from. And she just, you know, we're busy. We work with our hands. It's what we do. And uh, she was just really prodigious. Uh, this is a fern basket. Um, you know, I started the basket series shortly after she passed away and I wish she would have seen them because uh, she really was inspiring to me. This is my sister Ray Friday uh, assembling a basket. Um, and through this, this process of glass making, glass kind of really has one of those high cost, high, you know, high point of entry. It's really tricky to get in. And so I find a lot of joy in sharing glass with other native communities. You know, I've been doing this about 26 years and a glass is one of those things. It's a lot like being a musician. Um, you can suck for a long time and, you know, banging out the classics. Mary had a little lamb on the clarinet. It's like, Every parent at the first child's recital just kind of like, uh, you know, keep it up, you know, and it's a glass is a lot like that. You know, it takes a long time till you make stuff that you're proud of. This is in front of the Evergreen Longhouse at uh, Evergreen State College. It's uh, the Squig Wheel, the House of Welcome. And this was uh, this this program and this this was all started by my aunt Mary Ellen Hilaire Hatelwit. Um, and I was really honored to be involved with this group of elders teaching. Uh, international uh, indigenous people. It's my auntie, Mary Ellen Hilaire, really powerful woman. And through that program, I've been able to share glass uh, basket making with other tribes and, and, and basket weavers who might not be able to have these that access. This is Hela, Hoanut, Old Peter. And, you know, this is one of her Thunderbird baskets. Um, this is the group from that residency. This is studying in the Burke Museum where I'm really grateful to have, they've just recently collected some work from me in their archives. And uh, I know museums get a lot of flack about the patriation thing. And I think that's absolutely beautiful, but I also uh, appreciate that there is a place where natives who, you know, a lot like anywhere else, the politics of intertribal politics, being able to see a lot of these artifacts that could may or may not be like rotting in my aunt's closet, uh, you know, I think that there is a place that we can all, I like it that there's a neutral place where we can all go and appreciate these great uh, artifacts of the ancestors. Um, oh shoot, it's not letting me go. Oh, what am I doing here? Oh, there we go. All right, this is a clam basket from the Burke Museum, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years old there that they've restored. And this is a clam basket my sister made out of a steel and glass bullet shells. Um, this picture is very powerful. Uh, this is uh, a picture of Hetalak, Frank Calera, my great great grandfather, uh, and he's teaching the settlers about the shwala or the reef net. And the technology of reef net fishing originated in the Straits uh, with the Coast Salish people. And you can see he's a, at his time, he was a, a reef net captain and a very powerful member of the tribes and a spiritual leader 
up in up inside the Fraser Valley, straight of Georgia, straight of Juan de Fuca. Um, but you know, he started his life in what we would call he was a slave from another tribe. He escaped in a war and made it to Lummi, where his mom was from. And uh, you know, slave meant something different. He was a lower caste system, uh, a lower class citizen in our tribe, but worked his way up to be a very powerful uh, person among the tribes. And next to him is Chief Martin. Uh, and they're teaching the art of reef net fishing with this model. It's hard to see, but there's two big anchors in the front. There's a ladder of ropes that kind of drive the salmon off the floor of the ocean. And between those two canoes, the canoe models, there's a large net. And when the fish would be driven off the bottom, they would they would bring the canoes together and catch the salmon. Well, this technology is what helped give them commerce, give them the ability to trade with the settlers who, you know, uh, making it through the winter, struggled to feed themselves. And with this teaching of the teaching of the, the shwala uh, or the reef net, uh, this is what spawned the ca commercial canning industry in the Puget Sound and the commercial reef netting industry and consequently banned natives from reef net fishing. Um, this is an image of kind of how it works. You can see that this false floor, this ladder of rope with uh, reeds tied to it would drive the salmon up off the bottom as they migrated between the two canoes. This is reef net fishing in Cherry Point. And so in uh, 2013, uh, they, uh, the US government allowed the Lummi tribe to uh, to start reef net fishing as formally, uh, you know, and finally start honoring their treaty rights. Um, and a lot of that was backed by these stones, these anchor stones, much like the totem poles return to the earth, these anchor stones mark the floor of the sea, uh, really indicating where these places were historically. And uh, uh, that CN are the anchor stones. Uh, are, you know, an anchor is really symbolic for a lot of other reasons. So I really do enjoy making them. This is a, Anchor, a glass anchor with cedar bark rope. There's some more of the anchors. This pair, it's not a great shot, sorry. This is, these pair was just collected by the Portland Art Museum. And aren't you um, making, weaving that rope yourself, Dan? On yes, the... that, that's hand woven cedar bark rope. And I'm not, I don't have the patience of some of the amazing like Haida weavers or the watertight baskets, but I, I do I enjoy that process. And a lot of what, uh, a lot of what I enjoy, what people don't see, oftentimes people see the work and either like it or don't. But what is so amazing about glasswork is the teamwork, the shop, or how it was produced. Um, and that's what I find a lot of joy in, is that making of the work. But in making of this other work, like my museum work, uh, I just recently had a solo exhibition at the Museum of Northwest Art. Uh, it kind of takes away that thing where I'm only a gallery artist, which I'm very grateful for. But when you're showing at a gallery, they're like, okay, here's 10, 20 square feet. You better sell half of it or we don't call you back. Or, you know, your space gets, you know, it's relative to what your success is, a, is a, in the marketplace. And uh, being able to show at a museum, being able to tell these stories, being able to share the stories of Coast Salish people, the Wakami people, uh, Lahaktamish people and, and my family and my family's stories, that's what brings me a lot of pleasure. And uh, just weaving this rope, uh, it connects me like a bridge uh, through time to my ancestors and how they spent every waking day. And to uh, when I'm weaving this rope, and this piece probably has about eight feet of rope, man, it takes hours and it's so much preparation. That's all these people must be doing. So imagine you've got to make thousands of feet of rope for a reef net. I mean, it's just like, there's no such thing as child labor laws back then. It's like all families, all people pulling the canoe, the, the analogy of a canoe, everybody pulling for a common good. And uh, the reef net not only was how they fed themselves and how they sustained, but it's also a binding, like a governance. It brought these families together from all the islands uh, for, a, for a common good. This is a Chanel, the salmon, spirit of the salmon. You saw that uh, run that I made for the Wadsworth exhibit. These are, it's a it's a blown bubble connected with a solid head. I don't know if there's any videos or were some videos. I think we left the videos out, sorry. Uh, this is 
Doug Burgess helping me put the final touches on my reef net exhibit. Uh, it's hard to tell in this picture, but there's different sections of the reef net that I dyed in different colors. And that represents how the different families would weave a separate portion of the net. That's that governance or that binding thing. And together they would sew all their nets together to create one. You have a big family, you've got more people making net, you need more resource. Um, and that, that that's what really was the glue was this thing they got around. And I really like to point out the, the willow bark hoop in the opening that is a built-in mechanism of conservation. These people revered the salmon uh, so much. The first catch of the year with a reef net, they would stop and go potlatch on the beach for a week and let a week's worth of salmon go up. And if you heard the lovely Brandy Culp mention the chief or the tip of the spear on the, the salmon people, uh, that's the, that's, those are the large genetics, the ones that drive, that guide this, the school through the sound. They would let those escape through that hoop uh, to continue to breed, to continue to sustain, to continue to uh, create next ne the generation generations of food. Um, this is again from the atrium or the entryway of the Museum of Northwest Art. This is my longhouse, um, and it's uh, my experiment in neon. And uh, you can see these are cedar planks inlaid with glass. Um, the female or the straight or the strongest posts are always on the left side of the longhouse and they just have the straight grain and the knotty less less predictable wood was the male post on the right this uh piece is uh the cuomo colchon it's about the the great mountain mount baker by right by lummy that overlooks the sailor sea and uh this piece was just collected by the seattle airport uh this is the sockeye sockeye moon this is a, a moon, a full moon with uh, the white butterfly or commonly known as the cabbage moth now, which all gardeners hate. But when you're a reef net fisherman, that's when you know it's time to get your nets in the water. Um, these are the weaver's triangles, the sailor spirit, red faced dancers is actually my cousin, Ron Hilbert, also who's passed away, uh, missing and murdered indigenous women piece. This is a very famous painting by Paul Kane, famous in our world anyway, because this is one of the few depictions of the skucka or the Coast Salish dog. And this is uh, couch and women weaving a really traditional, I pointed out the blankets in that first slide, but this, uh, this industry, this, this textile industry was, it's, was really so impressive to the first, when Captain Cook, uh, he wrote about the skucka or the, the Coast Salish dog in his journal. And this is evidence, and this is the this is the you know their connection with animal husbandry. These people were pretty proficient, and uh, this dog's fur is actually what they wove with mountain goat wool, mm -hmm. nettle fibers, uh, uh, cedar cedar bark to keep the moths away. This is how they created those those beautiful blankets that you saw in the beginning. Um, and I get a lot of inspiration from the weavers. This actually, I just saw this blanket last week. Again, this is at the Burke Museum. And it wasn't until recently through DNA testing that they proved what the Coast Seagulls people had been saying for years, that these blankets are actually from uh, majority dog's fur. And the skucka, uh, unfortunately, these, this and there's one other picture and is thought to go, have gone extinct in the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was largely due to the slaughter by the Hudson Bay Company who wanted to eliminate their competition. Um, but these guys had a, a, a thriving textile industry of uh, dog fur at the time. And it's an amazing story. And hopefully with CRISPR and gene editing, maybe one day I can have a Coast Salish dog. These are my scuck up blanket panels. And uh, again, kind of honoring the old colors, but you know, as a glass artist, a lot of my grandfather's totems are red, black and white and really uh, natural colors and dyes. And, but glass has 400 colors, <laughs> I'm, I'm using all of them. Again, this is back to Dale, and this is kind of where my work takes me today. Uh, or if you can see, I'm in the far right corner. I'm kind of a puppy at the time. And my good buddy Trent is in the front right corner. I don't know if you saw Blown Away, but that's my guy that he was just a young kid at the time. Uh, but what Dale, when I caught on to this, what Dale was doing was, uh, you know, given these at youth risk, uh, at risk youth, uh, just access to glass. 
uh, in a way. And I just working on those projects, I found it so rewarding. And I knew that I one day wanted to be able to bring that to my tribe. And this is the very first year of the Pilchuck Glass and Native uh, Nat Glass Native Camp at Pilchuck. And this is a couple only, only a couple days. And some of these kids, these are from the Lummi High School, and some were from the Lummi Youth Academy. And uh, you know, this just brings me a great pleasure to, to to again to share this with 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 people from the tribes. This is uh, in Portland with Anea, the Native group in, in Portland, Oregon. This is again, another image from the Pilchuck group. Um, this is my sister teaching. I'm not a natural teacher, but again, that's just, I guess I, it's my due, you know, that's, you pay it forward. It's not my calling to be a teacher. I mean, I feel like, I'm, but I end up doing a fair amount of it because I feel like it's, uh, that's helping share. That's like sharing this, what so many people have held the door open for me, um, that it's uh, imperative. And, and people ask why glass? because it is a, a, an odd carrot to dangle. Some of the first uh, years of the glass program that we started was, you know, we were using kids from the Lummi Youth Academy, AKA the foster home. And these kids showed up and they don't have a sweatshirt and it's raining and they had one pair of clothes for a week. And it, glass seemed like an unreal carrot to sort of dangle and almost cruel in a way to be like, look at this glass school where we, you know, one kid ate 17 bowls of Lucky Charms, if that will tell you what, what that's like. And uh, these two girls, I always I bring these two girls up because they grew up on the same reservation and they're from two separate families that don't speak. And uh, they are aware of each other in, uh, you know, their whole lives, but not, uh, but never, you know, you just don't talk to the Hatfields and McCoys. It's how you do it. And after this week up there, I could have swore they might have been best friends. Uh, and that's what glass, that's what doing this work is is brought for me. And, you know, being in the moment, working with glass, um, being able to be burnt, it keeps you in the moment. If you have some sort of ADD or some sort of like, uh, you know, the you're trying to forget about the troubles at home, glass keeps you honest and in the moment. This is uh, my family today and my dog. <laughs> Heiska, Heiska, thanks for coming. I'm really sorry about the the delay and, and sorry about my unprofessional uh, performance. I guess things only happen when they're supposed to. And thanks for hanging in, you true blues. Uh, it was wonderful, Dan. No problem at all. We're so happy that we were able to connect and, and get your uh, computer sorted out in time. So thanks so much for sticking with it on your end. Um, your presentation was amazing. And I think that you know, something that's just so incredible about your work is uh, not only, of course, the, the technical prowess that goes into it, but the connection with the community and the stories behind it and being able to hear a little bit of that from you is just so special. Um, so thank you for sharing that tradition and the stories of your community. It's so important. And uh, we're really, we're thrilled to have you as part of the program today. I'd like to open it up. And um, if anyone has any questions, please um, either put them in the chat or unmute yourself. We would love to have you um, ask away. Um, Dan, the moment in Fired Up when, um, when you were um, had to leave, but you gave your totem to one of the other contestants, um, why don't you talk a little bit about that? That was such a moving moment for me. Of course, I didn't want to see you leave. Yeah. I was enjoying all your work, but maybe you could uh, comment about your interactions with those folks and uh, you know how you felt about leaving and staying and yeah, well, it was like um, yeah. I guess I mean I'll just kind of cover all the bases and get to that place. Mm -hmm. I mean. I think I don't own a TV and I grew up without a TV and I feel like that might be largely why I'm an artist. Uh, <laughs> but so I was a little, it was a little bit of culture shock to like be immersed in the reality TV world. Uh, you know, they're hyping up the drama. And I think that a lot of people get into art because they're not like competitive people. It's like, it's not, you know, I mean, I, as anybody can speak to, it's like, I know when I go to look at art, what I like and what I don't like. And that's obviously subjective. And, uh, but I think that it's done so much good for the glass community. I mean, hey, look at the amazing show Fired Up. Uh, look at, look at uh, what we're talking, I mean, we're talking about it now and it's, it's brought, 
it's it's helped it's helped all the ships rise with the tide in a lot of way uh and so i went on uh you know i didn't really have my heart set on winning if i'm being honest but i i'm glad that i i had a good showing you know i would have liked to win one more maybe but i wasn't uh you know it was i mean things just happen how they're supposed to and uh trent that that's one of the things is they really want to hype up the drama because i guess reality tv shows these days are uh 90 day fiance or bachelor and i mean like people get married in 90 days is that even like <laughs> what are we watching you know and uh so that's to all the cast and crew that's what they work on is those sort of shows and so they're really trying to like hype up the the orange county drama or whatever it is and uh you know i was just grateful that there were real moments and some of the best parts again are behind the scenes when uh people in the glass community who i will always try and uh you know i, I will never leave i'll always be talking about that droning on about the the glass community but it is uh you know, it was hanging out with all these, my friends in, uh, in Toronto and going out every night, hot pot, Indian food, karaoke, all the, all the good times. Um, and so when we, when I got there, I knew seven of the other contestants and most of them for 15, some of them 20 years. And mm -hmm. so it was, uh, it, I don't think that it was, I mean, I think it worked out great for them, but it, you know, that, that, that competitive thing. And then I think when just a little bit of, like unscripted humanity slides through. I think that's okay too. And then I'm, I was glad that they I wasn't sure they were going to use that because they do two takes for everything. Mm. And uh, I mean, so much of it is just like stand over here, say this again, do that. <laughs> so I mean, I was it just worked out the way it, it did. And so thanks for saying that. Yeah, and for people, I, I think most people are familiar with the program, but for those that might be on that have not seen it, um, Dan is talking about the Netflix reality show Blown Away, which is a uh, Glass blowing reality show that has been, um, it's now in its third season that Dan participated on. And it was funny because when I asked Dan to participate in our program, um, it hadn't been announced yet that he was going to be a contestant. And oh, wow. so I, I got him on the Fired Up program. And then I think it was like a couple weeks later, uh, the cast of the reality show was announced. And I said, Dan, you were holding out on me, <laughs> not telling me that you were going to be on that. So, <laughs> so it was a nice coincidence there. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was uh, it was one of those things. Yeah, biting your lip. I'm like, well, you, <laughs> everybody's talking about this thing I can't talk about. I'm not really a big secret person, but again, you know, just that community, a glass. I'll, I'll just always turn back to that, like Brandy and that that show she put together, and with uh, you know, it's it, there's there's so many different people that uh, I mean, glass. I mean, we're all kind of looking for our family, right? I mean, whether it's the family we're born into, whether it's your glass community. Uh, that's why I feel really fortunate just to have this glass community. Somebody asked in the comments, how big is the Lummi Nation? There's about 3,700 Lummies that live on Lummi, uh, the peninsula. And then I think there's total about 6,500 registered or enrolled tribal members. Um, one of those things, I think that's what we're doing in this life, though, is we're trying to find those connections and trying to find our uh, our extra family. And I, I mean, I knew right when I landed in glass that, you know, it's, I might not have fit right in if I'm being real honest when I got here and I didn't have uh, I kind of had a colorful past of my own. Um, but I mean, through a loving community, and, and you know, just the rest is, you know, history. And I kind of knew I was right where I was supposed to be. Any more questions from the group? Uh, I don't have a question, uh, Demi, but I just want to say hi to Dan and to thank him for sharing uh, the wonderful and fascinating stories about your cultural history and your ancestors it's wonderful to see those old pictures um you know they they have a tendency to disappear over time so it's great that you were able to show them and obviously it's great to great to see your work uh i've known dan for quite a few years and has seen uh his work progress to where it is today which is just fabulous and i'm very happy for his success and for Raya as well, she's become an integral part of Pilchuck now, and that that's great to see. So, thanks very much for bringing uh, the the art and the culture and the history to uh, the glass community. Nice and um, that's sort of in 
tune with someone put in the chat uh, whether or not Dan is training a new generation of Fridays in glass art. And <laughs> I really appreciated that you added some photos of Raya in your presentation because yeah. um, I know that she's been doing her thing as well. And you're so supportive of one another. Um, that's really wonderful to see. Yeah. I and like again, she's a lot of she's helped me with so many of my things, even if just talking me off the ledge sometimes, because art is crazy. <laughs> um, I am so excited that she's working at Pilchuck and this last summer just being up there. And uh I'm glad that she could kind of come home. That's what we're always saying up at the reservation here. So when you're coming home, uh and uh, we don't live on the reservation, but we are a whole lot closer to it. In fact, uh, I'm actually now moving to Samish lands and Upper Skagit. So it's will be right next to, to Pilchuck. And so, hmm. yeah, I'm grateful to to get the family back together that way. Can, Any can more I, questions? I'm sorry, I need to talk some more, Demetra. Um, <laughs> Dan, what you're describing, I think, is true for a lot of the people that I personally know on this talk. You know what I mean? We've become, I'm a collector um, and now an educator, but we've become a family with the artists, with people like Brandy Culp, and uh, there are a few gallery um, owners on this um, talk also. So I, everything you said, I could have said, about my interactions in the last 25 years that I've been a member of this community. And um, we're all here for each other and it's quite wonderful, I believe. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dan, for a really, really wonderful and thoughtful presentation. Also a big thank you to Brandy Culp from the Wadsworth Museum. I cover and my butt. <laughs> there was that. <laughs> it, it was my pleasure and you know that's that goes back to what we're all saying we're family that's what we do we uh we make sure that things work when they're when they're not working for each other well, well yeah. thank you and that exhibit is up through february of next year so i really encourage you to make a trip to hartford if you haven't already because it, it is quite an amazing thing to see in person um, and wonderful to be able to see your work, Dan, um, in the museum in real time with Brandy. So that worked out very well. Thank you. Thank you to you both. Um, yeah, you, I appreciate that. Do you have any final things you'd like to say, or then we can sign off? Uh, no. Okay. Keep on keeping on. Yeah. Thanks for coming. I think, and I appreciate you guys for hanging in there. Of course. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for your talent. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.